audio stories in between stops. This story is for everyone. It's called Gayway and is about how not to treat your relatives. It was two days after my 57th birthday, the insecurity, just a possibility at the moment, of my position hit. It was the birthday card from my Aunt Edith that started the mathematics. Whilst I was getting older, my family, or what was left of it, were a damn sight older than I was. Their time for dying was moving closer, and as far as I was aware, the contents of their wills would be of interest mainly to only one person, me. For my mother, I am her only child who has sacrificed its life to care for her in her dotage, and her only child who is unmarried and devoted to her. For my Aunt Edith, my suspicious Aunt Edith, I am too much. I am too good to be true without either girlfriends or boyfriends, living alone in my small flat, devoted to the needs of my three relatives. For my Uncle George, I am an angel, listening to his stories for exhausting hours as he slowly disappears into his whiskey glass before I stagger him upstairs to his bedroom. And my three relatives, my mother, my Aunt Edith and Uncle George, have all assured me I am their principal benefactor in their wills, except for a distant cousin who, for the family's sake, will receive a small gesture. That threatening music changes the tone of this story. Because I am not a devoted child, I do not live alone in a small flat, and I am not an angel. Also, my partner informs me regularly I am calculating evil and a manipulator. But I am also, and this is why he puts up with me, a sexy, ingenious, generous, warm individual whom he loves passionately in the big luxurious flat we live in together. I would like to say the uncomfortable guilt I feel at deceiving my family on not one but two fronts has become too difficult to bear. But being a calculating and evil manipulator, I know this is not true. I have lived for 57 years in the closet, a stupid but effective metaphor to illustrate the presence of my homosexuality. I could carry on deceiving them quite happily until the lids were closed on my relatives and opened on their bank accounts. I have scaled the upside of my rainbow and time is now sliding me down towards my pot of gold at the other end. Or was. But the status is no longer quo. Tizzy has appeared. And Tizzy is wearing the dark cloak of trouble. Tizzy is one of life's banana skins that I have skidded upon, and our affair a mere ripple on my sea of faithfulness. Or was. I giggle when I'm drunk, and I babble too much. And as Tizzy is as calculating and evil a manipulator as myself, I find myself trapped in the role of a victim of blackmail. Tizzy is threatening to broadcast my sexuality to my family and as Tizzy has appeared it is obvious that Tizzy must now disappear. But I am gay and we gays live on the civilised end of the cucumber of life. We brighten conversations with our elegant gestures. We reduce pollution by not conceiving children. We spend the pink pound. We do not play football. We are gentle tender people. But as I feel squeamish when even peeling a potato or having to close my eyes when using a corkscrew and hide under the stairs during thunderstorms, I am incapable of ridding myself 
of the dark cloak. And so tomorrow I shall go to the nursing home and step out of my closet in front of my mother. Her face wrinkled her wrinkles in disbelief. Involuntary, her hand flew to her mouth in horror. The fastest move she had made in five years, except for the next. Her hunched back shot straight, her eyes snapped shut, and she pointed to the door. She pointed to the door for the next five minutes, until the nurse gently folded her arm down and slipped the sheet over her head. I sobbed openly all the way back to my car. I sobbed from the pain in my head. With my brain squeezed between the sliding door of sorrow on my right and the vibes of delight from the door on the left. The door of my closet had not time even to close before Aunt Edith glared. I knew I was right from the day you were born. I knew you were gay. Her exaggeration fitted her action. I was hauled out, torpedoed towards her solicitor's office to change her will. Don't hang behind, you waste of space, she snapped. Again, her exaggeration fitted her action. She turned and raced between two parked cars, her dash perfectly timed for her to vanish under a bus. Uncle was a revelation. He thought for a moment as my news percolated through the malt, and then, as the whisky receded, his grin advanced. Get another bottle, he beamed, to celebrate. Tizzy, whose hand was open for the first instalment, took the news badly of the passing of my three relatives, and he flounced, screaming, into the sunset. But the small gesture left to the distant cousin was troubling. A small gesture times three becomes a not such small gesture, and the distant cousin was not only distant in distance, but also in age. In fact, he's nearly 90 and totally alone. Hmm. Think I'd better go and look after him for a few months and then break my news.